us back to London. Uh, Francois Picard, I understand you're sitting by with Andrew Smith. I mean, the word we're seeing here in East Le Moulineau, in Paris, as well as uh, from Buckingham Palace, it seems like a more modern uh, Ascension Council. A more modern uh, Ascension Council. Well, for you, for me, for young Andrew here, the first one that uh, we've ever seen, obviously. So uh, it, it certainly is the case. Certainly the first one that's televised. As Ken, Catherine was mentioning, uh, first time there's women. Uh, there's a lot of firsts here. And uh, really, the first 24 hours that uh, Charles, this figure we've known for all our lives, for many of us, uh, is King, and uh, we are pleased, yes, to welcome Andrew Smith, Thank you. Uh, senior lecturer and head of the liberal arts department at Queen Mary University London. Uh, thanks for being with us. Your thoughts just now watching King Charles III. It's extraordinary, isn't it? It really does feel like a first. It feels like a momentous change. And I think that's one of the things we see in these offices of state, a real sense of you know, continuity. Um, you look at somebody like Brodel when he wrote his histories, and he talked about different scales of time. You know, this is beyond the history of events, something that seems momentous about the shifting fabric of the nation state. And so it really does seem like an enormous change, I think. Uh, uh, yet it's a moment in time. Mm. We're, we're, we're scrutinizing what's uh, continuity and mm. what's change. Absolutely. And we can look at even the, uh, the Accession Council and these ideas, these almost Anglo-Saxon traditions, um, updated with things that look to the Act of Union in 1707. We can see the... The, the Act of Union with Scotland. With Scotland, of course, yeah. yeah. Uh, and we saw the, the oath, the Scottish oath. And uh, we can see it existing in the language, the Norman language, around the demise of the crown and all the rest of it. It speaks to the continuity of state there. And I think that is really important. But you're right, it marked a real change. Look at that Accession Council. Look at the people in the room. It looks very different than it did in 19. This looks like a different moment, a different, a different, a different Britain um, and a different United Kingdom. I think people uh, across the UK, uh, what do they think of all this, this pomp and circumstance? Well, I think it's uh, one of these things where, um, in reality, the, the monarchy, the sovereign, has always sought to, to kind of rise above the politics of the day. And, of course, that hasn't always been possible. Um, I remember being asked by the media back at the uh, Scottish independence referendum. You know, the Queen was asked, you know, uh, when she said that people ought to think very carefully about their votes. And people said, think oh, is this, a, is this an intervention? Is this something happening? We saw the European referendum. It was. Clothes, it was her weighing in. It's a, a minor, slight one, isn't it? And you can see those ideas. And will they be minor and slight with Charles? Difficult to say. Of course, way back in 2015, we saw those black spider memos intervening around agricultural issues, around the environment. We've seen them very active in campaigning for the environment, meeting people like Greta Thunberg, of course. Um, and we would say maybe that Charles might well be more interventionist in terms of pushing for those priorities. That remains to be seen. But this is about him making those customs. He is now sovereign. Those are his to remake in his own image. As a historian, a political scientist, this is a fascinating moment because... I guess the key word here is legitimacy. If um, uh, we're ordering drinks from the pub downstairs mm. and you just decide to order them, I can say, who died and made you king? <laughs> In this case, uh, uh, we're, we're watching this unfold. Yeah. How much do these rights matter? Or is this just a bit of pageantry? Well, I think it does matter. Um, we saw already in, uh, in King Charles's first speech um, this idea of family. He spoke of his own family. He spoke of his heirs. He spoke, of course, of his late mother. Um, he spoke also of family of nations and the family of the kingdom itself. I think there is a real importance placed on these oaths, on the way in which they bind the state together. We know, of course, we don't have a codified constitution, and we heard that in Charles's address last night. King Charles spoke instead of the principles of this country's constitution, and those things are important. Important, where there are no codifications, no documents in this thing. Instead, we look to these customs, these traditions, these pageantry to, in fact, provide a certain measure by which we understand the passage of power through these, uh, through these halls behind us in Parliament. There are reasons that these, uh, these traditions exist, which mark past struggles, past battles and past laws. Do those words weigh more in 2022 when we've seen uh, what's unfolded in the United States last couple of years when we see how in France there's calling into question of uh, the uh, 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 the calling into question uh, of uh, how much the outsized power of the president has. 
Uh, absolutely, and I think that is something that is really crucial. You know, if we look at uh, the monarchy essentially being a golden thread woven through the fabric of the nation, this national story, this tapestry that it creates, instead what we might start to see are frays that occur, every constitutional crisis that we see emerge, these challenges to the legitimacy of power to our political structures, and in fact those are very valid challenges. So the monarchy does need to move, it adapts, it changes. We've seen the, the firm, as it's called, adapt in its own way, and that I think is crucially important, but it needs to match politics and the will of the people. These are important partners in this sovereign bargain. So um, much of your remit, Andrew Smith, is France. Mm. What do you think of the system they, they've got back here? <laughs> it's an interesting one. I mean, um, I was speaking to you about uh, Emmanuel Macron's inauguration way back in uh, his first term. And of course, he was trying to reinvest some of the sort of grandeur of the state and show you know, how this was about the republic writ large after Monsieur Normal, his predecessor. And in fact, what we see here is very much the power of the state writ large. And I think this is one of the things that helps uh, support some of those ambiguities, the creative ambiguities of state um, that are allow for these adaptations. Years ago, René Massigli, who was uh, the ambassador, of course, uh, from France to the UK, um, spoke about this idea that in France there is this big word unconstitutional. In Britain, they say, it is not done. For Massigli, that was a great strength, but it has also been a weakness at times, as we have seen in recent years. Yeah, General de Gaulle said that uh, the Queen was uh, France's proxy uh, monarch mm. uh, because we're so fascinated by what goes on here. It's not just France, by the way. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of nations. Yeah. And this, despite uh, we could delve into the domestic politics mm -hmm. of today, the laundry list is very long indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, why is that even today, even in 2022? Well, we spoke about the, the, the narrative of the, the British nation, of the United Kingdom. But I think you can also see that in the narrative of other nations. And we could look at France's national narrative. And of course, as a president, uh, when you see yourself pictured beside the British monarch, you can look back to de Gaulle standing alongside her. If you are a US president, you can do exactly the same thing and look back on 14 US presidents and all the rest of it. This is important because it allows people to connect to that sense of history. We mentioned Brodel. It connects them back to a sense of the shifting of the tide and the firmament of the realities behind political power. And that, I think, is crucial. It provides people with a kind of a little something extra for their own narrative. It provides them with that gloss of power, that idea of history with a capital H. And as so many of the people uh, where Catherine Nicholson is now at Buckingham Palace are working class people mm. who took their Friday off to come down and, and lay flowers. It, 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 talks to what you're describing. Sure, yeah. People invest a lot of, uh, a lot of value in that, that person of the sovereign. We know you get these sort of parasocial things where people feel they are connected, they understand the stories. Of course, you pick up the tabloids and they're full of stories of minor royals and their lives and all the rest of it. People feel invested in it as a form of kind of proxy for the nation. And um, it's been described by some historians as a form of almost British Shintoism, you know, this idea that you invest in the, the body of the state, this almost kind of godlike power. It becomes not just a proxy uh, monarch for other nations, but a kind of proxy religious figure, I think, within the UK. And people really invest and emotionally connect with that, especially with the figure of the late Queen as well, who, of course, represented such uh, stoicism, I think, in power. And, uh, of course, Charles, uh, King Charles uh, really emphasised that, 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 that notion of service um, uh, every time he spoke of his mother uh, today and yesterday as well, of course. And that is what I think people value in that. And, of course, uh, now that uh, and you just watched it live right here on France 24, Charles has officially been proclaimed king uh, well, the next step, I guess, is this period of mourning mm. and the whole world will be coming here uh, to uh, London for that funeral of Queen Elizabeth. Andrew Smith, uh, many thanks for being with us. Thank you. There you have it, Will, uh, for, from, from here for now. And I got to say, it's a bit of a subdued uh, London we're seeing this Saturday. It feels a lot more like a Sunday. It's quiet and a lot of uh, social events cancelled this weekend. It's a quiet UK capital we're in.